Hey folks, this video describes the steps and methods in one of my best glider builds so far. I implemented some new techniques this time for better precision and construction quality. Let's have a look. I begin with a smooth sea grain balsa sheet of medium weight and mark out a wing plan somewhat akin to that of the Ares Sharp DLG. I then cut some strips from very dense A grain balsa. These will add strength and dent resistance along the wing's leading edge. Marking the center line on each spar allows me to balance it on a flat edge and thereby to find which side is heavier. Each full strip of wood is 36 inches long, cut from a standard sheet, but each wing is only 18 and a half inches. So since I want the heaviest, densest wood for this purpose, I'll cut each desired piece from the heavier side of its respective 36 inch strip. Now actually, I cut 20 inch pieces, because the distance along the curved leading edge is already a bit over 19 inches, and at least one inch extra is needed for holding the piece in place while bending it. And to achieve that bending, soaking the pieces in hot water, as I'm doing here, is paramount. A-grain wood is naturally flexible, but dry-forming such dense balsa risks the formation of small fractures that do decrease the piece's strength. Here, to keep the steam and heat in, I simply lay a paper towel over the pan. Works better than you might think. And after about five minutes of soaking, these spars are flexible enough to conform to the curve of the leading edge. I attach the first pair, one per wing, with tight bond glue, and after those have dried, I attach the second pair, which I've cut a little shorter to slightly accentuate the wingtip taper. Here you can see how by smoothening the join between the longer and shorter spar, the wing taper is accentuated slightly. The wing blank was then finished. The next step was to sand an AG-47 airfoil. The process has begun by marking cord lines at intervals along the span. Since these lines are parallel to the cross-section, they can be used to define the airfoil. There are no cord lines near the wing root because the cord change there is negligible. I then print out an AG-47 airfoil at some arbitrary cord length and draw in the rectangle that its cord and height imply. Using several planes, I approximate the airfoil with a polygon indicating the percent cord at which each line or plane intersects the rectangle. I will transfer these percent markings to the each cord line on the wing, and by connecting those dots, I will have to find a proportionally accurate airfoil all down the wing. The plan here is to mask off each plane and sand it individually. So I begin with a large top trailing edge plane. Applying the masking tape in this case is crucial. The surface must be dust free and the tape must be stretched taut around that curve. I then make these two fresh sanding blocks, one with 90 grit and the other one with 150 grit. It's important there's no paper overhang here, as that can catch on the wood and make dents and scratches. It's also important that minimal adhesive is used. The paper must not be allowed to warp or bubble. I use Super 77 spray adhesive. After sanding the first plane, I remove the masking tape. Now, the second plane is trickier. It's in the middle of the cord and defined by two pieces of tape. This introduces trickiness because the tape does have a substantial thickness, and we must account for this by shifting the tape's position outwards somewhat. You can imagine some trigonometry here, considering a triangle where one side is the tape's edge, one side is the wood surface, and the hypotenuse is the sanding block. Now, this trigonometry is actually kind of cool and tricky, and you should totally have a go at working it out yourself from this information here. But for now, I'll just tell you that these two distances come out to both about 3 millimeters each. Definitely not negligible, so this was an important consideration. Here, I'm marking cord lines along the bottom of the wing in preparation to lay down this piece of masking tape, specifying this vertex here, defining this plane here. I sand the plane, and then remove the masking tape. The next step is to sand the taper in the airfoil thickness. On wings with a consistent cord taper, this step would have to be done first, because the whole wing would need a gradual taper throughout. But since this wing's cord really only tapers near the tip, it makes sense to sand the trailing edge airfoil first and taper the thickness afterwards. To control the thickness of the wing, I cut out these two soft foam risers and lightly glue them to the ends of my sanding block. They define the average wing thickness over the tapering portion so that I can't accidentally sand it too thin, but they're squishy enough that I have some leeway to control the sanding block's angle and height. The corner is rounded here so that it slides around instead of denting the thin trailing edge. Here you can see the thickness taper on the left wing, and here on the right wing. The next planes I sand will be on the leading edge. The angles are much steeper here, so the masking tape has to adhere impeccably. To that end, a coarse cloth and some 50% isopropyl alcohol solution are used to clean the wood surface. But careful not to overdo it here, because with too much water, the wood will deform and the tape will stick poorly. Here you can see why such good adhesion is important. Just a lower eighth inch of this leading edge has to be masked off. 
Here's the piece of tape defining the other end of that plane. It's this one here. And here's the wing after that plane has been sanded. Here's the second plane to sand. I apply the masking tape defining the front edge of the plane, and then the tape defining the rear edge of the plane. Here's the wing with that plane sanded. The two planes sanded so far are both visible here. I used a finer 220 grit sanding block to ensure that that vertex there came out nice and crisp. I'm now sanding this plane here, and I think at this point you understand the process. So with cord lines drawn, the plane's intersection points are measured and marked. The masking tape is applied following that curve, and the plane is then sanded. And well that, the third plane, finishes off the top of the leading edge, as you can see here. In this picture, all four leading edge surfaces, the three angled planes plus the unsanded lower part of the vertical edge, are visible. I continued by sanding the plane here with the same method, and then rounded off all the vertices, resulting in this smooth looking wing. I then split the wing somewhat roughly into its two halves so we can finally get a glimpse of that airfoil. Now this is evidently only a crude approximation of an AG airfoil, but what's cool here is that it's a consistent cross-section along the entire wing. Without this rigorous method of sanding, such consistency would not be achievable. Well, with the wings finished, now the rest of the airframe, pedestrian though it may seem by comparison, must be constructed. So I begin by cutting out the fuselage parts from medium weight 1 8 inch thick balsa. We've got two side plates, one bottom plate, two triangle nose cone thingies, and one top plate to be installed over the wing joining area. The side plates are scored along their bend lines and then fixed at the angles with a few drops of thin CA glue. They're then assembled with the bottom plate, again using CA glue. The tapering nose pieces are cut at angles such that they can be glued together in a snug fit. The triangle thingies are then curved around the nose and glued in place with CA glue. The copious overhang of the parts here allows for a lot of sanding, and the fuselage comes out as one nice smooth contiguous form. But it's not very strong that way, so I roughly cut a few pieces of 3 quarter ounce fiberglass and apply them to the main stuff carrying section of the fuselage using Rocka Composites very good quality laminating resin. This wedge shaped piece, cut from quarter inch balsa, goes in the rear part of the fuselage to provide a level surface onto which the tail boom can mount parallel to the wing cord. This length of carbon fiber tube will serve as my tail boom. Here I've drilled a hole for the elevator pull cable, and here I've joined the fuselage and the tail boom with CA glue. The next step is to build the tail surfaces. Usually I cut a surface as one piece and score the hinge line later on, but I was running out of lightweight balsa so I had to cut the stationary parts separately from the control surfaces as shown here. To sand them in a contiguous airfoil then, I joined them temporarily with masking tape, as before cleaning dust off the surfaces to improve adhesion. Here they're both sanded to an airfoil shape and hinged properly with 3M packing tape. The stabilizer mount is cut from hard 8th inch balsa and sanded to something of an airfoil shape. A groove is then sanded in the center of the stabilizer and the stabilizer mount is installed. The rudder is then glued into place on the tail boom with CA glue. The awkward geometry of this join will later be smoothed out with some covering material. You also see I've installed the spring holding the rudder at that deflection. I'm now making two circular impressions in the fuselage to snugly fit the coreless brushed motors of the two servos whose plastic casings I will be partially removing to save space. And here, with a control horn made from 16th inch aluminum and a pull cable made from nylon thread, the rudder is attached to a 6 gram HD powered HD1600A servo. Here, with the same setup, the elevator is mounted. With a 4-channel Lemon RX DSM-2 receiver, the aircraft is bound to my DX-8 transmitter, and satisfactory deflection is confirmed of both tail surfaces. The next step is to achieve a smooth join between the wings and the fuselage. These triangular balsa pieces will fit in as shown in this diagram. Clearly they afford a significant amount of strength to the joint, and the consistency of adhesion is therefore important. They must tightly hug the curve of the airfoil. So Windex containing ammonia is used to soften the balsa and achieve that curve. I take a paper towel, I fold it, I fold it again, and then I lay the pieces on one side, spray copious Windex on them, and fold the towel over, pressing firmly to make sure they soak thoroughly. Here I've installed the wings with the triangular fillets. Masking tape is applied in preparation for the fiberglassing. I also put masking tape on the wings, so that I have somewhere to hold the aircraft in case my hands get resin on them while applying the fiberglass. I cut four pieces of fiberglass cloth for the top of the wing fuselage join and apply them as shown here. These four pieces are for the bottom of the join. Here they're applied. Then to further smoothen the join, I decided to try something new. I made a sort of lightweight wood putty by mixing fine balsa dust with thinned tight bond glue and applied it roughly as shown here. 
After sanding, the join was somewhat smoother, certainly the large surface aberrations were evened out, but overall, for the addition of almost a gram, this technique was not quite worth it. But no matter, it was interesting to try it, and I learned something new. Well, with the wing join finished, the only part left was the aesthetic detail. I cut these tissue patterns, the red from Asaki tissue and the orange from Easy Built Light tissue, and using thinned white glue, applied them along with a blue leading edge stripe, as shown here. I then added this fancy stripey thing on the right wing as an aid for maintaining orientation when flying far from oneself. I finished this process by giving the colored area a light coat of Tester's lacquer, excuse me, of Tester's extreme lacquer, and sanded it first with 1000 grit and then 1200 grit sandpaper to create this kind of satiny finish. And then, well, that's it. All done. A finished aircraft. All up weight is noticeably higher than my other gliders. That's intentional. I'm taking this one to university with me, and I want it not to only last me a while, but also to handle whatever windy weather might prevail during the sparing free time I'll have for flying it. And speaking of flying it, well, I flew it, and it was great. Let's have a look. You can see it's not trimmed out perfectly, but it's promising, certainly. And that's it, the build and the first flight of my new balsa wood glider. I really hope you enjoyed this production, folks, and as always, thanks for watching.